Hi, everyone, and welcome to the House of Pod. I'm Kave. And I'm Lizzie. And if this is your first time listening, we're a medical sort of podcast where we try to discuss medicine and health in a relatable way. And we'll answer questions you may not feel comfortable asking your doctor and definitely won't bring up to your friends. On this episode, we're going to talk about whether or not it's important to be medically accurate in film and TV. And we interview Sharky Laguana, the founding member of the band Creeper Lagoon, about life on the road while touring, sleep hygiene, and addiction. Stay tuned. The opinions expressed on this podcast are broadcasted for educational and informational purposes only and do not represent the opinions of our employers. These opinions are not intended as a diagnosis, treatment, or as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please consult a local physician or other healthcare professional for your specific health care and or medical needs or concerns. Welcome back to the House of Pod. I'm Kaveh. I'm Lizzie. And I'm Joe. Guys, guys, guys. I'm going to skip the part where I ask how we're doing. Wait. I'm going to tell you how I'm doing. I'm stoked. I'm excited. We have a guest coming on, and I'm really excited about this particular guest. Sharky. 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 I couldn't be more excited, honestly. He's from this band, Creeper Lagoon, and one of my all-time favorites. So it's just an absolute... What's the word? Pleasure, Kate? pleasure, joy, honor, joy, joy. Privilege. all of them that we're going to be oh, able to hope, meet him. I hope he's not a jerk. Well, I'm excited today, but I'm going to go back. My week wasn't great because I yeah. Found, how was your week? I'm sorry. No, what? Thanks for asking. Yeah, it wasn't great because I found out through Facebook that Nadim Abu Baker, our behind the scenes producer, executive producer, executive producer, um, had surgery, needs surgery. He tore his meniscus or something playing basketball because apparently he's the athlete in the family. <laughs> and I found this out through Facebook. Yeah. And it hurt my feelings in my heart. Yeah. That he didn't tell you, call you directly? He normally calls me to tell me these things. <laughs> really? Just for the listeners out there, Nadim and I have never spoken on the phone and we've met like three times. So I'm a big fan of his. Poor though. guy. Poor guy. This is his third. Third surgery. time. Oh, All yeah. basketball yeah. related. All basketball related. He is wonderful. I love his insights on the show. And one thing he wrote when he was listening to the most recent episode was, The House of Pod. You don't even need Percocet to make it through an episode. <laughs> hey, that's high praise from Nadim. I was going to say. I was saying that, yeah, a drug reference from Nadim. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm sure he's... That's right. crazy. He must be pretty narked up. I'm yeah. sure the new He must be on like, a Percocet. <laughs> <laughs> if he was funny, he must right. be high. Right, right. right. No. I don't think he would know the word Percocet unless he was actually having to take one. Like, yeah. It's like someone forced him to oh, take one. Oh, he's... I didn't know he's so square. That's cute. Oh, yeah, I don't know if he's square, but... Well, one thing also um, I did over the weekend was, um, uh, is Nadim, he's Pakistani, right? Yeah. So I thought a lot about him. I watched this movie, The Big Sick, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which was written by this Pakistani comedian. Um, I actually, Kamil. Um, Nanjiani, I think. Nanjiani, yes. I think that's how you say it. I'm not 100% sure. And a lot of it um, was, it was all based on this girl he was dating who was, um, got really sick. Yeah. Emily Gordon, I think, right? Um, her name is Emily in the movie, okay. uh, became her wife, um, <laughs> his wife, sorry. And, and so much of it was like medically incorrect. Mm. And I really mm -hmm. wanted to sort of talk about it on the show. And I think we'll get a movie person maybe who writes That's smart. like screenplays and stuff to tell talk us about how, why Hollywood comes up with these things. Yeah. Like how do you, how, how do they you do figure this research? out? How do you do this research? Because yeah. they said things like, uh, the first thing, as soon as she got sick, we're going to put her in a medically induced coma. And I've asked my ICU critical care friends, one of my good friends, Allison, you know, does this every day. And I asked her the other day, am I out of touch? Because I haven't worked in an ICU yeah. in seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. Do people use the term medically induced coma? And, you know, she was like, no, when someone's really sick and your lungs are really not functioning well, you put them on a breathing machine and you tell people that you're making them sleepy with medication to help them be comfortable. You don't use a term. Like, why would you ever use the word coma to well, set off alarms? I, I, I've but, heard that term a lot, but, though. But let me ask you oh. this, though. Is it, do you think it's inaccurate? It's not inaccurate. And if a it's patient, just offensive if a, if a or insensitive? Not offensive. Insensitive, maybe? It's just... Maybe alarming is what you're saying. Right. Overly it's a, alarming. It's alarming. The word coma is right. scary, right? right? And if And she said, if a patient asks, or a fa sorry, a patient family member says, are they in a coma? You know, she would respond, yes, it's like a coma, but, you know, and we are doing it. It is a medically induced coma, but you wouldn't start the conversation with, we're putting her in a medically induced coma. You know, you would say, 
We're helping her breathe sure. on a machine sure. to make the patient more comfortable until right. we can right. treat the infection. It's not the language an actual doctor would use. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I was yeah, just right. wondering about the, the common parlance that like, is this medical jargon? You know, well, and it is, know, but we don't use it. It would be nice. And I have an idea about who we can get. But it would be nice to talk to someone who does screenwriting because I'm sure what they have to do is they probably know. They probably do the research and they probably talk to a doctor and the doctor's like, well, this is what we'd say. But they try to write it out in script and they're like, mm, it doesn't flow. It doesn't. People aren't going to like to hear that. Like, do you really want like your shows to like have real, if you're like a the common listener, um, to, to have the real parlance of medicine? It might be boring. Maybe it would. But and maybe when he brings it back to his friends and his family and he talks about it, maybe he says medically induced coma. But they had a lot of physicians talking to the patients and it just and then there was another thing they were like we're going to take her in for surgery and remove the infection from her lung with a procedure called a thoracentesis and all of this was so wrong and it just and i honestly i really like the movie i don't want to trash a movie because i recommend it and we would love to have one of those two people on as a guest (laughs) so don't don't mess that up no i totally recommend it um and i was really excited to see it and it didn't disappoint me but there were things that just you know when an acting is bad or an accent is bad it just takes you out of the movie and this is how i felt explain what a thoracentesis actually is so thoracentesis is um you know you uh take fluid from around the lungs so it's a needle procedure the patient can be wide awake. You know, most of the ones that I was involved with when I was training, the patient was wide awake. You don't you consider numb- it a surgery. It's not considered it's a totally, surgery. It's like a procedure. very minimally invasive procedure. It's probably safer or similar to a colonoscopy, you know, the, and there's no sedation. You just numb up the area on the skin near the ribs and you put a needle in and you remove fluid. And sometimes it's more involved, yeah. but it's certainly not, not surgery. surgery. It sounds like what they meant to say was thoracotomy or something like that, where they actually make an incision and then go in. A hundred percent. There's something that was wrong. Yeah. A procedure called a thoracentesis, a right. surgery called right. a thoracentesis are incongruent. And it just is frustrating. I remember we spoke earlier on in one of the earliest episodes about which show we thought was most medically accurate mm. and I said oh, which TV, TV show, show. Uh, yeah or no, a movie no, I think I thought you were referencing House of Pie Same I'm like but we're always accurate damn straight damn straight but <laughs> the the one show that I actually I changed my mind I said Scrubs and Scrubs is fun because um, Scrubs captures the pathos as Raja Jagadeesan one of our earlier guests mentioned but there is a show that actually is underrated in terms of its uh, medical knowledge and that's Lost now, I, I know it sounds funny, but the, one of the main characters on Lost is a surgeon, and there's a lot of these uh, like acute like sort of instances that come up during the show that he has to address, and they cover it pretty well. Like, there's a guy who gets crushed by a plane, and he's trying to work out the, the problem, but since he didn't know it was a crush injury, he didn't treat the patient the right way. Oh. It, and it's like, really, I mean, he even brings it up. He's like, why didn't you tell me what happened? It would have changed the way I addressed this. And he was totally right. So their medical consultant was, was, good. was good. We yeah. should get Actually, that guy on the show. For real. And I'll tell you this. In, there's a scene in uh, one of the guys, like one of the others in their house. And you see in the background, there's the ICU book. It was like the Bible that I read. I don't Marino? know if you had the same one. Yeah. yeah. Like the blue one, right? Like the light blue one. Yeah, it was Marino. I can. I yeah. think I have it. Oh, it's like one of the coolest books ever. It, like it deals with all these crazy ICU topics in a very accessible way for doctors. Anyways, they had that in the background. I'm like, boom, someone knows what they're doing in this show. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Anyway, I thought the movie was great, but these inaccuracies just sort of took me out of it a little bit. And I was just thinking we should talk to somebody about how you can write it in TV and movies to be accurate, but also dramatic. You know, you don't want to remove it. I understand yeah. the jargon is really, you know, boring, you know, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it's got to well, be accurate, though, or at least not have a trend of mistakes like that. I mean, we're not the target audience for that people they don't care what we think we're such a small doctors are such a small population of the movie going people i don't think they care yeah. but yeah we'll talk about that some more let's get someone yeah that's a good idea good movie though the big sick i enjoyed it when we come back we're going to talk with sharky laguana stay tuned Sharky Laguana, yes, musician sir. Yes, from sir. one of the greatest bands to ever come out of San Francisco. Not true. In my humble opinion, okay. which is usually correct. He's from the band Creeper Lagoon. I'm going to give people a little bit of background about this. In 1998, they were Spin's uh, best new artist. They came out with this album, I Become Small and Go, which was awesome. 
uh, and I thought pretty groundbreaking. 2001, Take Back the Universe and Give Me Yesterday, also a fantastic album. It was featured, uh, a couple songs were featured on Vanilla Sky in Orange County, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the band broke up around 2001. Yeah. <laughs> and you went on with a new lineup and released Remember the Future, which was also awesome. Mm. And now you're doing something called Bandigo. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Am I saying that correctly? It's Bandigo. Yep, perfect. Fantastic. What is it? It is a van rental company that originally started uh, to cater to musicians, hence the name Bandigo. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I know it sounds like Vandigo, but it's, it's B as in boy, Bandigo. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, I, I, you know, basically, it just came from my own experiences touring, which was you're trapped in a van for 10 to 12 hours a day. There's nothing to do. So right off the bat, we, we started off with this idea that was basically Virgin America before Virgin America was Virgin America. So we put in video screens and game systems oh, cool. and lighting systems and, you know, comfortable seating. And we just made it like a... a more comfortable place to hang out for weeks on end, which is what most musicians wind up doing. And as time went by, um, you know, it wasn't ever sort of explosive growth uh, until perhaps recently. But um, when did you start it? 2003. Okay. So it was just a a van parked in front of my apartment on Hampshire Street. (laughs) That sounds a tiny bit creepy, but I like it. (laughs) I live in a van down by the river, you know? Yeah, right, 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 yeah. So um, the big exciting thing for us right now is uh, this spring we're going to try and launch a new line if we can get the prototypes built. Uh, we're going to do a new line and a new brand, same location, same company, but just a sort of like a separate uh, division called Campago. Oh, cool. Wow. And oh, my God. It's like my Vanagon. I yeah. had a whole Vanagon yeah. story. It was mm-hmm. a, an awesome and unique, strange experience. This all sort of relates to what we want to talk to you about, which is that physical toll that must you must face when you're on the road and you're touring. Because you are stuck in the small, cramped little space. You're going from town to town. There's lack of sleep. There's problems, I'm sure, keeping your regular routines, eating well, Mm -hmm. avoiding drinking, that sort of thing. You know, we see all these people sort of become these sort of rock and roll casualties Mm -hmm. and like rock and roll cliches. You seem to have avoided that. How, How did you do that? Uh, so for whatever reason, I don't have that gene that <laughs> the adrenaline junkie dream, gene, gene. No, no, no. Um, addictive. I, the addictive gene. Mm-hmm. Um, so I definitely had a uh, pretty severe sort of self-medicating marijuana habit, um, back during that time, mm-hmm. uh, which was, you know, in hindsight, clearly just a way to sort of manage the, the various uh, stresses uh, that we were under and whatever, childhood traumas, yada, yada. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, certainly as a musician, you're uh, inevitably uh, exposed to and um, for a variety of different reasons wind up participating in uh, a large array of, of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I never, it you know, nothing ever you know, connected with me on that level where I felt like I got to do this again. I got to, you know, and often, you know, my experiences were mainly about um, trying to prevent my bandmate who was severely addictive and just trying to be there with him. Right. And, and, you know, it was sort of like this weird, okay, if I'm doing it with him, I can keep him safe mm-hmm. and um, kind of uh, be somebody that's on his side instead of be this you know, sort of outside force. Yeah, like a brotherly role as opposed to judging or yeah, it, or it, isolation. It, it, it was a theory that didn't really pan out. So mm. um, this idea that you're going to um, coax somebody through rehab by joining them and, um, you know, at least partially in their sort of abuse habits. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's probably a common misconception that you think that you can help someone by. Like, you know, I bet you that's how a lot of very young, naive people start like, oh, if you're doing it, it's okay, and I can watch you. You know, it's a it it's a codependency. A, There's an enabling here. It's, well, it's it, hard to avoid if you're trying to help your friend. Sometimes a, a, a band is inherently and implicitly codependent. 
Uh, so uh, it's it's like being a uh, a small squad in a mm-hmm. war or mm-hmm. you know something like that because yeah. there's just incredible outside pressure. There's no escape from each other. Right. And you're in tall, you know, sort of small confined spaces. Right. Uh, Nobody else has. I think of sometimes med school residency. Yeah. Like I say, some of these people, it's like you've gone to war with them because nobody else has that same schedule. Nobody is up 27 hours except you and that other person. Nobody else has that test on Monday so that you're partying Monday night. Like nobody else has the same routine as you except for these people that you're obviously just in a very close confinement with yeah yeah so yeah there's a couple parallels like that in life but it's 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 actually fairly rare for human beings to be sort of uh trapped together so closely and so intimately um i've certainly have spent more continuous hours with my bandmates than i have with my wife or my kids um or my friends uh you just it's not natural to spend that much time uh that closely with the same people so it was interesting you know we took a a 18 17 year hiatus (laughs) yeah uh, and then we came back and we did some shows and and it was incredibly emotionally powerful to all be in the same room and just immediately realize that wow, we really know each other and yeah. we're still fundamentally the same people. Yeah. It's totally like family, like, you know, after that time. But a lot has changed since then and we've all progressed and we've actually become... Closer because of it now. Closer and, and better versions of ourselves right. back then. I right. mean, you know, I mentioned uh, the bandmate had a lot of issues. He was able to... Um, it was a remarkable story. He was able to work himself out of those issues without ever getting into any kind of program. Hmm. Or uh, rehab, or trouble. Know, that well, he mean. he got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, a couple car accidents, oh, and yeah. uh, you know some other disasters. Oh. But uh, uh, he survived all of them, and uh, uh, and now he come. You know, he came out, and he's in this like incredibly healthy place where. He can have a beer or two at, at dinner or a glass yeah. of wine. That's pretty rare. That's I've never. Yeah. That's I've never pretty I've rare. Never heard of it. I've never yeah. seen it. Yeah. And I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Because right. usually having zero beers, if you're an alcoholic or having addiction issues, is much easier than having one beer. So that right. really is incredible. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a question. So you talked about addiction and on the road. And, you know, we were talking earlier about when, when I travel, I get totally out of my routine. Like I, it's harder to figure out time and space to, to exercise, again, to not overeat or over drink or whatever when I'm out. How, what advice do you have if you didn't do it well in your twenties, let's say, what advice would you have for people on the road now, whether it's a musician or, um, traveling a, salesman, a traveling salesman or a physician, they exist? Going, I don't know if they exist, but if they did, yeah. yeah, right. Or any, any profession where you're totally don't have a routine. I know friends who are device reps who just are constantly traveling, you know, right. right. So how do you do that? How do you maintain how, what advice would you have to maintain some sort of healthy lifestyle? You know? Well, I think there's a lot of science that suggests it's very important to have habits and patterns, um, that it's a way of kind of uh, luring your body into sort of sleep state, right? So, uh, I think when we were touring, uh, you know, the internet wasn't really here to tell us everything that we needed to know about sleep habits. Um, there was no internet pretty much. Your sleep hygiene must have been awful. Oh, it's, I I mean, it was, you you get to bed at three o'clock in the morning, you have to get up at eight or sometimes at five to to go to some stupid radio show and and you're supposed to be charming and witty and then you got to drive for eight hours and you're just in. You're like, I hate everyone. So, you know, of course this is a huge concern for me because now I run a transportation company and these folks are driving their vans. And over many, many years, we have had um, some really horrible accidents. Mm. Um, yeah. You think related to sleep? Oh, every single one was absolute. Every single accident we've ever had yeah. um, that was serious. Mm-hmm. And we've had fatalities. We've had, oh. um, you know, life-changing yeah, uh, injuries. And every single time it was, um, you know, we, we had one not long ago where um, the guy's didn't want to pay for a hotel room so they drove all night Mm -hmm. and then they stop at a uh, pancake house Mm -hmm. a waffle house or yeah one of those things in in, in let's plug ihop it's delicious yeah 
and they totally carve up mm. with, on no sleep. And so what happens predictably half an hour later, like they go into, you know, um, yeah. sleep coma kind of thing. Yeah. Pancake coma. Uh, <laughs> Classic. And, and the result was, um, quite a few people perished in, mm. in, in, in that accident. So I'm always, uh, you know, ha- having been through that and, and, and having experienced that as, um, you know, sort of firsthand, and, and I know what it's like, especially yeah. kind of there's this sort of vortex of hell that's in between uh, nobody knows who you are and household name. Right. And that vortex of hell is you don't have the money to pay for like things to be comfortable. You're not checking into the four seasons right. and, you know, getting amazing bedding. You're, you're, you're still in like some shitty hotel somewhere. that's yeah. like a one or two star and, um, uh, the bedding's wrong and you can hear your neighbors next door doing drugs and there's a party beneath you and like, right. you know, kids running around above you. Uh, and you know, having been through that, I, I know what it's like to live in a, a state of perpetual exhaustion. Um, and, and there's so many different things that sort of intercede to exacerbate that and, mm-hmm. and make it worse. So, you know, we're really, you know, very aggressive about encouraging bands to, you know, whoa, your tour is looking kind of crazy. Um, you're going to wind up paying more money because we charge per mile after 250 miles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there's a business case to be made that we should switch to unlimited miles and just charge a little more and then nobody has to worry about miles. Right. But I keep it in there because I think there's a human case to be made that if you drive more than X number of miles per day consistently, Mm -hmm. you're putting yourself at risk, you're putting the company at risk, um, you're putting your, your bandmates at risk. I think you should pay more for that risk and everybody else shouldn't have to pay more so that you can be a dumb dumb. So, so, uh, so we've kind of stuck to that and we talk about it on the website too. Like, you know, it's, you don't have to look at America as this place where you have to go from, you know, one city to the next and every trip, you know, uh, every, every travel between every city needs to be six to eight hours. You, you could do Oakland and then San Francisco and then San Jose and then you're sleeping in the yeah. same hotel three nights, right. you know. Yeah. It, this is a hard thing to talk to about like young kids who are in a band and they have this very Spartan work ethic and they all want to be like the minute men and like get into a van and travel like a thousand miles to like the next game. Well, the minute men's a classic example of how that can go wrong. What, right. what happened? I don't know. D Boone died in a van accident. Um, be, uh, he was sleeping in the back and, um, uh, uh, somebody was driving and uh, I think it was his girlfriend mm-hmm. and, and, uh, forgive me if I get the story wrong, but, uh, basically it was, it was similar situation. Yeah. Not enough sleep. Yeah. 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 I mean, how do you convince or do you even try? I mean, how much can you do if you're sitting with a, a young musician and, and having this discussion, what would you tell them? Cause the ideal version, the sexy lifestyle of being in a band is like, let's go for a tour, you know? And it's like, it is pursuing that like all nighter kind of thing. So I feel like part of the dream is, maybe trying to, you know, recreate some of these moments. Yeah, I think a lot of the biggest danger moments are when you try and recreate fantasies that never really existed in the first place. Um, you know, we, we there's a lot of bands out there that, you know, we'll see old documentaries on Led Zeppelin or whoever smashing up hotel rooms, and they're like, wow, that sounds cool, and I want to do that, <laughs> you know, and... Um, thing is, is, well, they were getting paid $800,000 for that show. So like, it didn't really matter if they caused $20,000 of, of damage to, you know, the hotel room and, and they were, you know, they had a plane with their own beds on it and, you know, they could, that's your next, uh, business adventure is plane to go. (laughs) Right. Plane, (laughs) plane to go. Yeah. I'll, uh, register the domain as soon as the podcast is over. (laughs) If if somebody hasn't beaten me to it, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, there's a lot, a, a lot of danger in the, the fantasies that are out there, and I think people would be shocked at how uh, disciplined often uh, the people that actually do succeed, um, especially now uh, when competition, I think, is, is tougher than ever. Uh, I think people would be shocked at how disciplined these artists are and how uh, attentive they are to... Um, 
their health, kind of everything about their health. I mean, I, you know, the most astounding example I can think of is, I mean, someday just take five seconds out of your life and pull up footage of the Rolling Stones performing. Mick Jagger yeah. is what, 72, 73? 70s, yeah, for Running sure. around. Yeah. I can't do what he's doing. <laughs> and and he does it he does it for two and a half hours. Yeah. And and if you think it's just like some crazy fluke, right. there's footage, you know, of him doing his yoga and his stretches and, oh yeah. and Bruce plays for like three hours. Yeah. Yeah. The, it's 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 funny because everyone when they start playing music, I think they um there's a part of the uh, the drinking and there's part of the drugs just to help them do it, perform, to help them perform live, to get over that stage fright, to do it. But it's it's really hard to maintain any sort of healthy lifestyle while touring and drinking constantly. But that gets ingrained to musicians so early. Like you don't do a show unless you're a little bit messed up because you do in my bars. You start off in dive bars. You're playing. You're drinking before your show. People are buying you drinks. People you are guys, buying you drinks a ton. These even guys that performed, I definitely bought you guys drinks. Sorry. Yeah, even our, Sorry. Yeah, contributing to our delinquency. Sorry, Thank it's you. It's my fault. So it, it's it's really hard to to break that cycle early on. Well, you know, there's there's sort of another, I think, for musicians in particular, another competing factor here, which is the kinds of people that um, fall in love with music to the point that they want to pursue this as a career. They're that passionate about it, and they're willing to kind of put themselves through all this uh, uh, stress and, and effort to kind of get there. Psychologically, it's, it's, it's my experience, certainly it was true for me it was true i think for all my bandmates um it's true for 99 percent of the musicians i've met in my life there's some fundamental trauma or um you know issue uh, mental health issue lizzie's pointing Both to joe guys. and i right now <laughs> yeah. as he says that. i know what you mean though there, there's a certain creativity that comes from having pain right I, I you know one of the things i think about it um i think i read this somewhere is is Music is an attempt to make order out of chaos. And it's, it's uh, you know, taking something that's sort of like fundamentally crazy and trying to channel it into something that feels like it makes sense and is, is taking you someplace. And the other thing that I think about, this is just sort of my own internal theory, which is music when it's at its best is really just reporting. But instead of reporting the facts, uh, you know, it's raining today in San Jose and it's 78 degrees, right? Like that's a kind of reporting. Mm -hmm. This is a different kind of reporting. This is how I feel right now being me in this particular place and in this particular time. And when I examine my emotions, this is, uh, this is what comes out and this is what it's like to be me and feel like I do. And I think that that is, when people really tap into that on a on a you know real honest uh, essential level, that's when other people go, "Holy shit, I'm getting the truth now. I'm mm -hmm. getting um, I'm getting something real." And and this is what creates authenticity. This is why uh, a reggae band in Seattle is not as compelling as a reggae band in Jamaica. And this is why a you know grunge band in Jamaica is not as compelling as a grunge band in Seattle because it, it's about reporting you know, who they are and how they really feel and, and what's going on without like sort of trying to, you know, ride somebody else's experience. And it sounds like a great form of therapy. You know, you're talking about sort of channeling it and it's just if people could do that in a meaningful way and not necessarily do it for the wrong reasons like fame and audience and accolades, you know, if you're doing it for your own reasoning, that sounds like a great like benefit. You, you know, though, what's interesting is it, yeah, I can see how it is in some forms of therapy, but if you're really being authentic to the song, I heard... Bono say something once where he was like, I can't sing the notes right unless I'm emotionally where I was when I wrote that song. Like, do you think there's sort of a risk to your mental health to always have to put yourself in some sort of, if you're really being authentic, to putting yourself in, a, in that weird mental space again and again and again every night? Yeah, how do you keep it fresh and real and authentic? That's Without losing your mind <laughs> yeah. and being clinically depressed. Well, you know, um, I feel sort of very fortunate and blessed uh, that the music that we made is, I feel, at its core, optimistic and hopeful mm -hmm. and warm and loving. And so to come back into, you know, w just this isn't every musician's experience by, by far. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, uh, 
uh, who is it? Uh, Chester. Uh, Bennington. Yes. The, the who, guy from Lincoln Park. Yeah. And yeah. Lincoln Park is essentially, uh, you know, all of their music is about being alienated and depressed. Yeah. And um, oh, he just he committed suicide. He committed suicide. Four or five months ago, I think. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, whereas, you know, our music definitely has sad elements and, and things that are sort of examining um, mm-hmm. uh, pain. Uh, but they do it through uh, our, our writing. You know, when I look back on it, um, it tends to do it through this almost sort of hopeful lens mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and or bittersweet lens. And so to come back into that and and I, I you know, I had a couple thoughts. One is, holy shit, we were a lot more timeless than I realized. Like I was just saying to these guys before you came in and I'm like, trying not to be too effusive here, but I was listening again to like uh, I Become Small and Go. It holds up. Yeah. I mean, it holds up completely now. And that doesn't go for every late 90s act or 2001 act, you know. It really holds up still. And I think uh, not just the sound, not just the the vocals, not just the, the recording, but it, at what you said, it, at the heart of it, there's always this optimism. To me, great music has to run the gambit of emotions. It, you have to have a little bit of humor, some sadness and happiness and all that stuff. And you have all that stuff. But at the core of it, there is this sort of underlying optimism and hope in, in the music. I think that's a big part of why it holds up still. Right. That's what people do when they, they meditate. It is. It's like reinforcing positivity, you know, whether or not that's how you feel, you're trying to convince yourself. So if you can take yourself to that time, again, it sounds like a great way to do it. Just as a side note, Mick Jagger is 74, close to 75. It's pretty yeah. impressive. Just want you guys to and know. And I just saw footage of him from like two weeks ago, and I can't Insane. do what he, I can't do now <laughs> what he's doing now. Right. Like, I'm yeah. not even close. And just for our listeners, you're, he's nowhere near 60. Far younger than 60. Sharky is. <laughs> Sharky, yes. sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, people don't necessarily, they can Google you. Yeah. But, uh, right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, but to... I don't know, sort of wrap up that, that, that last bit. Um, when we reformed um, and I first started rehearsing the music, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of like a constant, uh, I was just rehearsing by myself sure. to kind of get reacquainted. Were we, you going online to look at the tab or did you remember? I did. You I actually did. went online? <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't remember <laughs> shit. Um, and I had to download all the songs and buy software to slow them down <laughs> and without changing the pitch. And, and I, I actually wrote tabs for everything. Nice. And then we published those tabs on our website. Oh. Uh, yeah, I did it as a Google Doc. I was like, well, I did it. I might yeah. as well share it with everyone. This is a oh. way to communicate your music. Tab right. tab is like the notes, the written out. This uh, is like, I'm like Joe right now. I like don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> tab is short, really insecure. Tab is short for tablature. Uh-huh. And tablature is a way to uh, describe how to, how to play virtually uh, right like no 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 uh, just guitar is very particular uh-huh. so sheet music for guitar doesn't make any sense oh it's where the fingers lie the yes because right. yeah, a, a, a critical part of guitar is where do the fingers go and mm-hmm. on what fret are you in because okay. if you say c middle c on music there's three different spots on the guitar where that middle oh, c can exist yeah. so yeah. tablature says no you play it down here or up here you bend this string or that string got it so it's it's like a, a different kind of musical notation and tab is for short. And so what I did was, and I didn't just do it just for me, but also for my bandmate right. who, who was maybe, uh, didn't have quite the work ethic I did and I wanted to, <laughs> uh, make it easier for him. But, but what I was going to say was in the process of, you know, the first, I don't know, dozen times I rehearsed it, it was like impossible to not cry. Oh, uh, I, I mean, it was just so overwhelming sort of connecting to, you know, just, you know, um, most of the stuff I hadn't listened to and, you know, I don't go Years. around listening to my own music. Um, I listen to this podcast all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to our music. Um, yeah, me too. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, to answer your question, yeah. I mean, there's, uh, you know, if you're reporting on emotion and you're not feeling the emotion that you're reporting on, then yeah. you're doing a pretty bad job of reporting. Um, yeah. you, you have to sort of convey that emotion. So if your music is all about anger or your music is all about hate or your music is all about depression, you might be, um, you know, uh, signing yourself up for stuff that, um, you might regret later. Uh, you know, it, it may have a a negative impact Mm -hmm. on 
who you are as a person and, and, and it's where you go. interesting because you want to be authentic. So if that's what you're feeling, you want to write it. But in 20 years later, you might not be able to feel it or perform it as well as you do you now, know, when you wrote it, so, now, which is which is fair. It's okay, right? Some people, you know, seem to figure it out. I mean, all the guys in, in Metallica are still with us and, mm-hmm. yeah. um, you know, they, they seem to be doing okay. I mean, you know, from... Without well, without re- that, without revealing too much, I know you know there's some stuff going on right. there. But yeah, I think when Lady Gaga performed with them, I think that was really probably a, a problem for them <laughs> to really communicate <laughs> the anger and the hate when but, she was just you know I watch right. I watch the Grammys right. every year. But it goes back to what you're saying. Like those guys are all really disciplined. They look great. I mean, at least physically, to some degree, they stayed healthy. Right. right. They may right. be doing drugs, I don't know, or yeah. drinking heavily, but at least on, to some degree, they've been able to stay relatively healthy and fit. If you can do this job, you know, for 20 years or however long, they, they clearly are probably not getting too far into any sort of substance. I mean, maybe that's a total farce. I have no idea, but I can't imagine you being, you know, a cocaine addict or a really bad alcoholic you know, and, and do this physically demanding, yeah. mentally challenging job for 20 years, you know? At some point, reality intrudes. Yeah. You can do it for a while. Right. Uh, but sooner or later... It's going to fall apart, probably. Gra- gra- gravity is gravity, and, right. and you're not going to escape it. But if you had kept going, I mean, where do you think you guys would have ended up with your bandmate that was having problems? Do you think inevitably it would have caught up to him and been something serious? Oh, we were on track to be dead within a year. Like, I, 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 somebody was going to die. So it's sort of good you broke up for the health of uh, everyone. Oh, I, I you, know, you know, at the time I was devastated. It was a multi-million dollar recording deal, and we were walking away from it. Oh, wow. All we had to do was stay together. Mm. And there was a massive advance coming to us on, you know, we just had to finish a cycle. And everything was starting to open up. Like, yeah. wow. radio was playing, MTV yeah. was playing us. We were getting offer opening slots on arena tours. The thing is, is the, you know, the, the path that, that we were on, uh, you know, particularly with my bandmate, I mean, it was heroin, it was crack, ecstasy, mm-hmm. alcohol, often all of them all at once. Wow. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, really just a matter of time before something really bad happened and at, at his rate of progression. It, you know, it was accelerating. It was picking up speed. It wasn't. Yeah, you slow. can't stop that trajectory once it goes right. You can't. And so, you know, I look back at it, and the, the funny thing is, at the time, I was devastated. Like I, you know, sort of woke up at thirty, and the only thing I knew how to do was play guitar. And I, you know, I just lost my job. Yeah. Um, and not only that, but like that particular kind of job, it's not like you just go right. apply for another one somewhere right. else. It's that's it. You're you're and you're over thirty, so now you're also. It's like uh, old for the scene. Yeah, like that's that's old for the scene. Yeah, you're aged out. Uh, you know, you're like uh, like somebody shuts. You're a major league baseball player at like 37, and then they shut down your team. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's like nowhere. What to do go. I do? Yeah, what do I do? Uh, and so at the time, it it, it was. Uh, you know, catastrophic, and I was terrifically depressed. Um, looking back on it, it was 100% the best thing that ever could have happened. To everyone. To, to everyone, uh, you know, perhaps particularly for my bandmate, but um, uh, for me, you know, I just look at it as like, whew, we really dodged a bullet. Like, that could have been bad. Yeah. And it's now really- it's just like, you know, this uh, interesting memory. Throwing more money in a attention into the equation probably would have sounds like it would have been people uh, are, catastrophic you go places people are uh, showering you with adoration and providing you guys with whatever drugs alcohol you can handle or not handle i mean inevitably it's it's almost impossible to not be sucked into that vortex. Well, I mean, look, especially if you get any kind of notoriety for it. Yeah. I remember we played a show with Elliot Smith and I was like, anything I can do to put myself between Elliot and my bandmate, yeah. I will do. I've got to keep these two right. guys apart. Right, right. And I was only semi-successful. Um, I, I, I did some major cock blocking there. <laughs> <laughs> but Great strong. Great yeah. turn. Uh, but, uh, uh, they did eventually wind up hooking up at, at, at the end of the night and, and got up to, you know, no good. And, and two years later, Elliot was dead. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it was great to talk to you. I sort of feel like I got to say you, you have, you have a podcast that is about, 
um, medical stuff at sort times. Of. Yeah, at times. Um, but I have one of the craziest medical stories I think you've ever heard in your life. All right, everyone, that is the end of this episode, but it wasn't the end of our interview with Sharky. Before he left, he went on to tell us the most amazing medical story, and it was so good that we had to turn it into its own episode. So definitely stay tuned to the next release of The House of Pod, because I think you're really going to like that one. In the meantime, we want to thank Sharky for a great interview. If you haven't heard his band yet, check out Creeper Lagoon. Google them. Trust me, you won't regret it. They're a pretty important band to us. I think you're going to like them too. Also, check out bandigo.com. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. Review us on iTunes if you haven't. Tell your friends to listen. It really does help. We love your questions, so be sure to keep them coming at hopquestions at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail, anonymous or otherwise, at 408-444-6623. That's 408-444-6623. Mwah! All anecdotes and patient-related details were changed with respect to date, sex, and certain details so that patient identification is not possible.